Hey guys, today I want to talk about life, death, the pursuit of happiness, and um, what it means to give it all up. So if you're watching this, you, I don't know, there's a lot of reasons I imagine someone probably clicked on this video. I'm probably going to name it something like the inevitability of suicide, or, you know, if you're considering watching suicide, well, if you're considering suicide, watch this first. And the, the reason I wanted to talk about it today um, was I'm, I'm going to talk about something pretty personal to me, but I think first it's important to know that um, I believe like life is sacred. Um, so moving forward with that, I, I want to talk about that. One year ago, it was a couple days ago, I didn't quite do it on the day. I didn't quite have what it took. And I wasn't even fully aware of everything that has happened. Um, but a year ago, one of my best friends killed himself. And I think what bothered me the most was I wasn't surprised by it. Uh, not only because I understood him and I knew where he was coming from that I knew bits about his history and his life and the things that he had struggled with, but because he was a smart person. And I think what's sad is when you look at the world through a certain lens, killing yourself makes an awful amount of sense. And today I just wanted to kind of talk about that and I mean, why it's dangerous, but why I still think life is worthwhile. But I want to say that ultimately, like, you know, if you are committing, if you are, you know, considering suicide, you know, disclaimer, obviously, get help, da, 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 da. Um, but in my full, honest, real, complete opinion, um, I'm a very big believer on free will, right? And so I don't know if this dangerous, it's dangerous to say this or if it's okay to put it out there. Um, but honestly, your life is your own. And... My friend, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, even to this day, I am, he's one of the most intelligent, bravest people I know. And when he decided to take his own life, I think it was sad to say it was coming from the part of him that maybe had a little bit too much common sense. And I think when you look at the state of the world, I think especially this last year, I've kind of been going through this process of sort of reevaluating how I treat people and how treat people treat me and how I move through the world. And I think we live in a really, really amazing world. I love my life and I love the world we're living in. Um, having said that, however, I look at, you know, just a lot of the paradigms upon which people approach, approach dating. I look at the way I was treated, I look at the way family structures are, I look at a lot of the things that I've been struggling with and I'm seeking to change and work through in my life. And as I've gone through and grinded through those difficulties and kind of been bounced around and really beaten up, I realize, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to like not participate anymore. If you don't like the rules of a game and you can't see why you're playing it, it's boring and it's painful and it's difficult, you know, why wouldn't you just turn it off? Why wouldn't you stop playing? And for me, it's because I, I don't think you can ever quit out of the game, but you definitely can leave certain parts of it. And the way you play other parts, the way you per play initial parts affects the way other parts go. I mean, that's the, that's the law of cause and effect, right? And so... That, I think, is one of the difficulties of living life. Because at the end of the day, there is a reality to how things work and how they function. And we view the world, you know, a bunch of different ways. Everyone has different opinions and things. Uh, but the emotions and the pain and the realities and the difficulties of these things are real. Okay, someone is trying to text me like crazy, so I apologize for that. That's coming from my other phone. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a lot, a little bit about just my philosophy on life and some of the things I'd notice. And I'm going to put this raw cut up 
And it's my intention to do a more refined video and just kind of kickstart things uh, a little bit. Now, uh, something that I want to do is I want to preserve the privacy of my friend. Those who know me personally uh, know who the person is. Um, but maybe some of those who don't know me personally don't know because um, outside of like my close circle or people I really trust, um, I don't really, I don't talk about this, right? Um, I don't tell this, like the people I'm living here, nobody knows about it and they're not going to know. Um, I mean, I'm putting it on YouTube and maybe they'll watch my YouTube channel, but I don't know. I, so one of the things that I'm working through on my own personal journey is this idea of vulnerability. And the reason I think vulnerability is so difficult is because in what I've discovered and what I can ascertain from my experience, the only way you can live a full functioning life and feel belonging and fullness and love, the only way love can come into your life is when vulnerability is a part of the question, is part of the equation. So when I, what do I mean when I say love? When I say love, I mean the willingness and capacity to have and take responsibility for one's well-being as well as your own. And I think to receive that, so someone else willing and being capable to take responsibility and help me for my own well-being um, as well as their own. And then vice versa, the being able to love someone, being able to, you know, have a friend or someone that you care about enough that you're willing to put yourself on the line for them. And I think I, I want to have a life, I don't think, I want to have a life that has that because I've seen that when life, when love is present in my life, I think it becomes a very beautiful experience, right? And as I've let love enter my life, I think love is a really amazing thing. I think everybody wants that. I think everybody needs that. I think the difficulty in life is just like basic resources, you know, water, food, shelter, clothing. Not everyone gets those and not everyone gets them in the same amounts and not necessarily in a level of abundance where they can grow productively and really expand as they're meant to. And so... Because of that, you know, when you feel like you're on a step down, you opt out. And once again, um, if you're watching this and kind of sensitive um, and you're in a really like dark place, uh, I don't want to be responsible uh, for what you decide because I believe in free will. Uh, I'm just saying that sometimes to love means you have to be illogical because I'm saying sometimes suicide is an extremely rational decision. It's almost too rational. And I think that's what's so scary about it is because like this time last year, I had someone who I really loved and cared for. I still love and care for them, um, but they don't really love and care for me. And I think when this moment happened, I there were certain realities where I recognized their capacity, not their willingness. This person was absolutely willing to love me but I recognize their capacity to do so was limited because of injuries they've had and things they've suffered in their own history. And so I felt that absence of love. And from that absence of love, there's this, because I, you know, I have things that I'm also working through, you know, like I have wounds and like, um, I have mommy issues, right? If we could talk about that. Um, and you just see all these issues and histories and all these things compounding from the very beginning of time, right? I think uh, probably a less personal matter is like kind of race relations in different countries, right? Where the problems that create, the things that created the problems of the past are not where we're going to find the solutions to the future. And I think that type of thinking is what is needed to progress. And you see that in a personal microcosm like within your own lives when you learn to forgive and then you let go you can move forward and I've discovered that to be true within my own life that's very difficult to do in mass right it's not that the laws to happiness are very complicated they're actually quite simple I think the law to life I think laws I think life is extremely simple I don't think it's easy it's like pushing a boulder up a hill it's pretty mechanically simple you just have to push really hard and you have to do it and you need to be patient and you know eventually it tips and then it rolls downhill and I think everything like that everything works like that 
and it's super simple if you pay attention. I think though, because of the difficulty and the simplicity, the difficulty and the simplicity of it makes it really, really scary. And I think a good reference is in Paulo Coelho's The Alchemist. He talks about how men oftentimes, you know, they begin to stop choosing their personal journeys because when they're given the rule of alchemy, which is so simple it can be written on a diamond, people want to conflate it or confuse it for, you know, egotistical gains, for advantage over another person, or just different things, or because they themselves don't want to try and implement what they're seeing. And so a lot of time we get our ego wrapped into things. And because we're living in a world that's in that, you constantly having all these reactions and these um, defensive mechanisms and all these things are just reacting to each other. And so nobody can stay the course anymore. It's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever done like a balance beam or, you know, you're trying to walk a tightrope. You know, you're walking a tightrope, and if you stay steady on the tightrope, it's very simple, right? Because the the road is very narrow, but if you have strong balance, it's simple. But when you get tilted or there's a wind, you know, you have to push against the wind a little bit to maintain that balance. And then the wind goes away, and then so the air coming back, and then there's another wind, and you're constantly having to readjust, right? Another analogy, I think, is like keeping straight on uh, when you're driving a car. Most of the time, you know, the road's pretty straight, but sometimes we're having to make tiny little micro adjustments to things in the road, right? Not these dramatic overcorrections, but oftentimes in life, you know, something will come down in the road or, you know, something's blowing up or there's just some crazy action scene or whatever. And so you're having to work, like, you know, swerve and weave through traffic to get to where you need to go in life. And life is simple. Just drive the road and keep going down it. Um, but so oftentimes, you know, we hit something, we crash, the car gets damaged, and wow, someone is really trying to get a hold of me. Um, I'm going to pause that. No, I'm not. I'm going to keep talking. They can wait. Um, so you're, bro- you know, you're bobbing and weaving through traffic or whatever, and then, yeah, you're just trying to live life. And then as you progress and you move through that, you might do it, but it's very difficult to do that, especially when we're having lots of obstacles without damaging the vehicle we're in, the car, whatever you want to call it in this analogy. And so because, you know, we're hitting things and we're getting our wheels busted, it makes moving and continuing in the journey hard. And we might even then have dam- the damage to the car. So we pop a tire. So now we've got to stop the car, jack up the car, put on a new tire. And there's all this work And we say, and sometimes can think, well, am I living life? Because life is supposed to be driving down this road, but you spend so much time repairing the car that got damaged driving down the road. And when you spend more time repairing cars than time driving on the road, it's very easy to forget why we live life. Like in this sort of microcosm of this analogy, it makes sense, you know, why you'd be like, man, I came into this life to drive, not to fix cars all day. And then, you know, I would opt out because it's, I want to drive the car, not be a mechanic. But when you're feeling constantly having to fix things because everyone's breaking down the road of life, that's super difficult. And I mean, that's, I think that's the difficulty of life is what are the things that compound and make the simplicity of life difficult. And so much of what people are struggling with, I know a lot of what a lot of my friend was struggling with was coming from that. A lot of what I've struggled with has come from that. And recently I was talking with a friend and we were talking about the idea of free will. He was an avid believer uh, that we don't have free will, right? Which is essentially fatalism, right? And if you don't know that term, you should look it up, Google. Um, But yeah, he just believed that, you know, things inevitably happen. Uh, but now we're going down all this deep philosophy and we can definitely talk about that. And I, I want to talk more about that in the future with coming videos. But really what I wanted to talk about was the impact my friend's death had on me. Right. And I'm not saying this to convince anybody. Otherwise, I'll be fully frank and completely honest. Like I want people, I think, to live the best life they can. But I don't know what that entails or what that means for them. And sometimes that means you know, not living it. I don't know, right? I'm not encouraging people to go, you know, before anybody says that, like, oh, you should be telling people to like stay alive. I I really don't think I should be telling people to do anything. 
Like, I think if people come to me for advice and want help and need guidance, that's what I'm apt to do. But if someone's like, oh, you should say definitively how life should be lived, I have no idea how someone else needs to live their life. I know what I need to do in my life because I can speak from that. And I feel like when I learn to speak from that and not necessarily encroach on anybody else, that's when my life started really working really well. And so I believe it's just my job as a person to share what I have with as many people as possible and those who are ready or willing and want to, you know, experience me in any way, whatever capacity that is available, they have the opportunity to do that. And, you know, some people it's just with friendship or whatever. Um, and, you know, some people opt out. And so I'll probably spend more time talking about maybe what actually happened. I think that's like, something a lot of people care about. I'm pretty philosophical and ideas are oftentimes how I approach things. Um, so kind of just talking about the story, I found out that a friend of mine, It's this is a really wacky story and I almost, I almost want to make a separate video about kind of the whole story about it and I think I will, just a different story about just everything that happened with, um, you know, the person I was dating, how they were connecting to another person. And there was just this huge storyline that I've explained so many times. And I feel like just making a video about it and putting it out there. So if someone like, oh, I want to learn this or know this about me, I can just put a video about it and then just kind of put it out there. And I, I'm a pretty private person, if I'm being completely honest. I don't like sharing my life. And I certainly don't like garnering attention for things outside of my ideas. So that's oftentimes where I'm going to steer these type of videos or conversations. Um, I wish this was more productive. I had so many thoughts that I wanted to share, but I think the biggest thing is just talking about life, you know, going back to that analogy. I think this is the thing is I really do believe in free will. I think life is what we make of it. Not in the sense that you have complete and utter control, especially from the get-go. But I do believe life is sort of a game and you can level up. And I think as you level up, you can get more powerful. It doesn't make you the god of the world, but I think it makes you more capable and it allows you to live your journey. I believe life is a narrative that's within us. And when we control the story... Of that narrative we can we can kind of control this the narrative and direction of our life and a lot of the time we've inherited stories or programming and from other people and we've taken that on and this is where i agree with my friend my other friend um from last night we'll call him we'll call him jay right um actually let's call him let's call him george so my friend who I was talking about free will, we'll call him George, and we'll call my friend that is no longer with us, at least that killed himself, we'll call him Zed. And one thing that I've learned from Zed, I need to stay focused. Um, but I think the most important thing, kind of just what I've learned from Zed and speaking to George is... I don't ever want the people in my life who I care about to not know I care about them. And obviously, that's a lot of people. And I'll be honest, that's one reason I've been really scared about kind of progressing and growing. I've wanted to do a YouTube channel for a long time, and I've been doing it, and I've been making videos. Like, by the time this video comes out, I have something like 80 videos. But I never told anybody about it because I was afraid of caring about more people and them not knowing that I cared about them. And it's a lot of work. I was afraid of the work. I did that with my writing. I, in the last six years, I decided to become an author. And in the six years, I've written nine books. But I only put four of them out because I was scared. I didn't want anybody to know about it because I was afraid that if people saw me as an author, they wouldn't see me as who I am. And I've, I've operated from a lot of fear about what I want in my life. And because of that, 
I've been living my life with the parking brake on, going back to that car analogy. Imagine having to drive that road, and because I'm afraid of going too fast, I'm living, you know, with that park, that brake pulled up all the way, and now, you know, it's burning and smelling really bad, and it's, it's damaging the car, and it's doing all these issues. And I think one of the issues that I've struggled with is that I want to go faster. I want to go through life as I know I can. You know, I feel like I have a, a tremendous amount of potential and unleash it, but I've been living with the parking brake on because I'm, I'm terrified, if I'm being completely honest. I'm super terrified that, you know, I can work and do all these things. And I'm not necessarily afraid of success or failure. I'll be honest, like... I live with a fairly high degree of certainty of my success. I'm not going to lie. Like I, I feel a tremendous amount of things will work out for me. I think especially lately as I've gone and I've taken risks and I'll talk more bit time about those videos. But the legitimate fear is that um, I'm going to care about a bunch of people who don't or can't care about me. And it's not that I don't want to do it, but I recognize deep down inside there is a dependence on that and that's scary to me because I don't want to have to lean on people who aren't going to be there for me because I've been screwed over right even last year I think I was I was depending on someone who I saw I couldn't lean on and it was not because they didn't want to they were trying their best but they needed things right remember we were talking about those damaged cars on the road and I realized like they needed more sort of mechan like they needed a mechanic and I needed a co-pilot. And that was what was so tough about making that decision. And I think I'm still dependent and I want that that the co-pilot and that help so much that I've been afraid to kind of drive the road myself. But I think it's also recognizing that, you know, if you don't have that co-pilot and someone looking out for you, it's easier to hit things. It's easier to get damaged. But if you have someone in the car who's trying to get you to drive their car, it's easier for your car to get damaged. I don't know. Now the analogy is kind of breaking apart. But we can't drive in other people's stories. We can only drive alongside them. And so if you have people who aren't necessarily looking out for you or even looking out for themselves and or maybe they hate life and they don't want to drive and they're trying to damage the car as much as possible there's a lot of people who are doing that that instead of trying to drive the road of life in advance they're just trying to smash into everything on the road and or maybe they're trying to run it over because they're hateful they're resentful and the car's damaged so they're just like screw it you know what i mean like if you have a really really nice pristine car and there's a smudge on it you'll clean it up and you won't want anything to happen to it that was one of the reasons I never wanted to have like an expensive car because if I had a cheap car, if there's a dent on it or something hits it or whatever, I'm like, oh, whatever. I didn't pay much for it anyway. And there's a lot of people who live their life that way. And this is going to sound judgmental probably because it is, but for a long time I was living with people who had that mindset because I had that mindset. But I realized if you're afraid of having nice things in life, because you don't want to keep them maintained, you will never have nice things. And if you want nice things, you have to be willing to maintain them. And everything in life works that way. There's no circumventing it, right? I think, and it, for those of you who can understand, recognize that even our food is based in this principle, right? Think about like an apple tree. An apple tree, you can just go and buy something from the super, you can buy an apple from the supermarket and you're not having to do the work. You're not having to maintain a tree. You're not having to grow an apple. You're not having to do any of the work, but you're paying money for that. But because you're always paying money for that and you're never learning how to cultivate that skill, you will forever be reliant and dependent upon a system that has nothing to do with an apple, but it's the only way you can get apples. Or you can learn to rely on the nature of apples themselves, i.e. grow a tree. But there's discipline, there's work, there's laws that you have to respect and work with in order to get that apple. But if you work with those laws, you can have as many apples as you want. And you can have more apples than you ever dreamed of. One apple seed contains an infinite amount of them if you are willing to obey the laws. That's how abundance works. But people think that comes from non-commitment. But... Well, I mean, people say oftentimes like to be unlimited and to be free is not to commit, but it's like, no, 
true freedom, true abundance comes in commitment. It's coming in discipline, right? Think about the fact that we're able to talk through this, the technological advantages of being able to talk on a phone. Like I'm literally talking into a random cell phone. And now because of this, you know, maybe a dozen people, maybe three people, you know, however many people are going to watch this. And that's only possible because someone committed to the technology and this technology, remember that same cascade of reactions in the negative sense, discipline to cast. That's the thing is you have reactionary cascades that are destructive, like for the car on the road. But what happens when you have a cascade built in discipline, built in direction, that's driving the road. That's navigating the road. And even though you have to take a left turn and a right turn, you're always aware of the final destination. And because you progress like that, you advance, you grow. That's how we got the phone. Think about it. Like just going retroactively from the phone, it works through like radio waves. And like those radio waves were discovered by like Marconi, right? And that's like Edison as well, like with electricity. And then, you know, you have Alexander Graham Bell with the line phone and all these inventors going back all the way to like Benjamin Franklin discovering the electricity, all these disciplined cascades. So it's the same reactionary thing, but it's not reactionary based off of things outside of you. It's reactionary or disciplined rather because it's coming proactively within us. And just like those damages of the car can build, growth also can build and that is what's enabled this interaction to happen there might be some people who have no idea who i am and are watching this and that's possible because of that disciplined cascade that reactionary discipline based in these principles of following the road of committing to the road right and because other people have committed and passed the baton again and again and again we have technology, we have aqueducts, we have indoor plumbing, we have the we have the modern world, right? Everything that exists around you didn't always exist, right? It was created by vision and from someone disciplined enough to make that decision and live it. And so if you're considering suicide and giving up your life, recognize that, yeah, you can react and you can have a broken car but the very opposite thing is also possible. And I think that's something I wish my friend had seen because he saw the nature of things really as they were. He saw the pain, he saw the heartache, he saw, yeah, there's a lot of people who don't care and who don't give a shit. <laughs> there's a lot of people like that. I would say, I don't even know if most people, I feel that way. I don't know if that's the truth, but I feel that most people don't care sometimes. But uh, most people don't need to care for things to be good. Only a few people need to care, right? I mean, that's why you have wealth gaps and things, but whatever. Um, and that's more in another video or whatever. Then that's something I wish I'd said to my friend. And if someone actually stuck out and watched this mammoth video, 28 minutes or whatever, I appreciate it. And I hope you found some value. But I just think something that's really important to just understand is that I think you're going to react. You're going to have to play in life. You're going to be forced to play. And sometimes you're forced to play with a hand you don't really like. And you're forced to play with things that have sucked. And I've, I've been dealt some pretty rough things myself. And my friend had as well. And I think one of the things that's been really crazy to see is just how different decisions lead to different conclusions. And like I said, I respect my friend. And he wanted to kill himself. And he didn't want to live. And I'll be honest, I respect that decision. It's not what I would have chosen for myself. It's not what I wanted for him. But at the end of the day, I did respect him. I do respect him, right? And I have a different vision of the universe, so I don't necessarily think he's gone in the eternal sense. But I recognize that he opted out at this stage of life. And, you know, for anyone in considering that or who's you know, is thinking about it, I mean, like, once again, I think, I think there's a lot of possibilities. And I think I would hope that you would explore what those possibilities are before making a decision. And this is where I talked to my friend George. And something that I wanted to say is that he was saying all these things that were fatalistic. But in reality, his experience and like his life experience, he's, he's been pretty stagnant. 
And it was like, bro, you're making all these decisions about life when you haven't really experienced life. Like you don't, you haven't gone out and actually lived life. You haven't played all the other things to do in the game. Because maybe the game, we were talking about the road, maybe the game is so much more than the road. Maybe there's shops along the way. Maybe there's monsters on the side of the desert. And the whole point of the game is completely different than what we're being told. But you only know that if you explore what happens if you get out of the car and then you ask where are all these things coming from? Maybe there's so much more to life than the road that we saw. Just like that analogy. And do you see how like that story and as we build and as we open how like suddenly there's this whole living vibrant world of possibilities? Maybe it was never about the car to begin with, right? Maybe it was about never driving the road. Maybe it was never about advancing. Maybe there's just a mountain, right, that you can view right? Or maybe this road is a rainbow road. Who knows what type of road you're driving? That's what's so brilliant about life. And I think it's just the willingness to take that, that narrative capacity we hold within us and be disciplined about it, to really take, not control of it, but to really work with it and to decide, hey, I'm going to explore what this is. And I worry because I think there's a lot of people who, you know, they're, they've been in a certain way and they haven't really explored the world. And, you know, they'll, they'll do drugs or they'll do alcohol and, you know, they'll just, just not to say that any of those things aren't great. I mean, I don't necessarily do drugs or, you know, drink lots of alcohol. That's not my lifestyle. Um, but one thing I am going to say, and that I think is really key and critical, and then I got to end this video because it's getting way too big. I think it's really, really important to just understand ultimately at the end of the day, life is so expansive. It is so much more than we think it is. And I think if you keep asking what more to life is there, you will find the answer. And I think you will, when you find that answer, you'll have far more questions. And I think that's what makes life so brilliant. And I love my life. I really do. I wish I could share it with more people. Um, I'm very lonely, honestly. I have a lot of really great friends. I've been living my life as I need to, though, and it's created a, a huge gap in loneliness. And I'm realizing more and more that in order to move forward, I need to be willing to take on and risk that, that vulnerability in those relationships. Because I've been meeting some really great people and um, obviously I think what I'm looking for and what I want, I recognize will only come as I'm taking that step forward and putting out this video and being vulnerable with it and actually telling people about it is going to be a step. And in the next, I'm going to be starting a project. If you're interested in anything I have to say, I mean, you would have to be if you've listened to me talk for 33 minutes about this stuff. Um, I'm going to be doing a series of videos uh, reading through a book called Cosmic Laws of Cosmic Awareness, uh, just kind of discussing the laws each one and kind of be doing like a little series project. Um, hold on. Hey Google, how many days since January 1st, 2021? Hey Google, how many days since January 1st, 2021? 261 days. So that means it is day 261 of Operation Thunderhead, which means I have 104 days left to become a full-time author and make all my income as an entrepreneur. And I'm sort of kind of doing that, but not fully. So I have 104 days left. And so, yeah, I spent the last eight months being very scared, and being very sad. And I've made a tremendous amount of progress. Now I'm going to do my best to try and take the parking brake off. So let's see if I can do that, eh? All right, guys. Remember, life is what you make of it. And whatever you decide, uh, just know that it is what it is. So, yeah. You're loved. Peace. Stay happy. Stay healthy.